Hello and welcome everyone. We're just gonna wait a few minutes to get kicked off here as people dial in. But glad you could join us so far for the folks who have dialed on. Tara Ariel, hope you're doing well. Yeah, absolutely. We're having some big storms roll through, so hopefully they just pass by <laughs> quickly. Fingers crossed, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no storm here, but super excited for this. Looks like we have quite a few people who are registered. Uh, so really looking forward for this discussion. Absolutely. That subject near and dear to my heart, and it's always a good day to talk with Sales Enablement Society. Very good. We're excited to have you. While we're waiting, good. if you can, if you can put in the chat like where you're uh, connecting from today, that I think that'll be awesome just to see some of the people and where they're physically located today. Yeah, there you go. New York City, Houston, Texas, Salt Lake, Seattle. Oh yeah, Harlem. Oh, we have some UK. London. Ooh, a yeah. few a few UK folks Iran. with myself. Yeah, and Guatemala. Guatemala. Excellent. <laughs> City a lot of places with much warmer weather than I have today. <laughs> <laughs> Rather chilly here. <laughs> For the folks just joining just in chat, you know, we're just curious where you're you're calling in from uh, as we wait for a few more people to get logged on and we'll we'll kick off in just a minute here. Shackley cold in Texas. I'm based in Wisconsin, so it's uh, still cold up here. Hi, Natalie Barry, nice to see you. Several names in the popping up in the audience. It's wonderful to see those those familiar faces faces and names. It's a small world at the end of the day. It's all enablement. <laughs> Seeing some people excited for it as well. So love the enthusiasm. Oh, and they're in Vegas. Yeah. We're going to be in Vegas soon. There's some conference there for <laughs> enablement. Very fun. We'll kick off for the folks who are still dialing in. We're just going to kick off in about 10 seconds, just as letting those last few people get off their last call, get joined on here as we kick off. And I see it is now three minutes after the hour. So um, probably a good time. I see a lot of folks on the call. So probably a good time to get us started. Um, so I will, I'll just begin by saying my name is Michael Hostler. Very excited to be with you here today. I've had the opportunity, uh, the, the pleasure of joining many of these webinars in the past as a participant and today uh, for the first time joining as the moderator. So very excited for this webinar and, and many more to come. And I have the pleasure of being here with uh, Tara Torkelson and Ariel Hitron of Twilio and Second Nature. So very excited for you to help us walk through this topic today on driving adoption of change through sales enablement. Um, but I'll turn it over to you quickly, Tara and Ariel, to quickly introduce yourself as we get going here. Awesome. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Tara Torkelson, and I am Director of Content Development and Delivery at Twilio. I've been in sales enablement for more years than I can even count on two hands. But I spent many, many years at Hewlett Packard, as well as ServiceNow, and currently at Twilio. So I've had some great experiences, and I'm looking forward to sharing with, with you today. I'm all, for those who didn't hear, I am based in Wisconsin. Um, and have enjoyed working remotely these last couple of years. <laughs> Ariel. Great, 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 great to be here. My name is Ariel Hitron. I'm co-founder CEO of uh, Second Nature and we've been working with uh, Terra and with uh, other organizations, helping them with their sales enablement. My personal background, I came from product, product marketing, which is kind of in, in the auxiliary of sales enablement and then moved into a sales role in the sales leadership role. I've seen the same kind of processes and rollouts and changes happening from both sides of the table and it's very different perspective. So after having all of that, went on, started my company and we'll talk more about uh, the solutions that we provide a little bit throughout the, the webinar. Very good, thank you. Well, um, I see from the chat feed and I, I know um, from uh, 
for, for myself, I'm excited to get going on this topic today. So uh, I'll, I'll start by briefly just letting participants know to please use the chat feed to ask questions as we get going. We'll ask some questions and some feedback throughout as well, but please do pop those in there and we'll pause every so often to get those questions answered. Um, so don't be shy. I know this audience isn't. Uh, so with that, let's kick off. I'm going to hand over to you, Tara and Ariel, and let you uh, start us on the conversation today. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, I, I, I'll just get us kicked off. And this is the mandatory slide about us. We're second nature. We're helping organizations, large sales teams have better conversations. Uh, and let's just leave it at that for now. We're going to talk a lot about driving change today. And I think that the environment today uh, even since we started kind of discussing this webinar and how it's going, it's changing so rapidly. So I think that driving change, change management, and the use of sales enablement in narrating this change and driving it to uh, the wider audience of sales is critical. And we're going to talk about the challenges in that, about uh, how do you roll up adoption and what are the hurdles for adoption what are best tra uh, strategies for executing it? And then on a broader level, how sales enablement can evolve for that uh, uh, change management and driving change effectively. So I wanna start off with kind of a more of a storytelling uh, just to kick us off in, in the thought process. And you know how a CEO and I'm a CEO of, of my company comes in and meets a sales enablement uh, leadership and says, hey, great news, right? Anytime the CEO comes in the room and says, great news, you know, you have to be concerned, right? They come in and say, hey, we have a new strategy now for this market, or we just acquired this company, this is amazing, or we're gonna roll, roll out Challenger, or any other sales methodology, or this kind of product that we have to roll out, is gonna be pivotal for our success, this is amazing. The only thing that you have to do, sales enablement, is just make sure that the entire sales team is aligned with this new change, okay? That, that's it, that's the only thing that I'm asking. And as most of you know, that's not an easy task. So in terms of change management, whether it's a new product, a new message, a new pricing, a new market, new methodology, new hires, or my personal favorite, just make them all A players. Right? That's all on us in terms of sales enablement, making sure that that happens. And so that to get us kind of warmed up and, and started, uh, maybe asking from the audience uh, the type of changes that they've seen recently that they've had the chance to roll out. Right, So we'll, we'll pull up a poll of what kind of rollout you've had the, the pleasure of experiencing in sales enablement. Well, it looks like it's definitely the new product rollout and new sales methodology are, are strong contenders, but certainly in, in all all the areas. And for those who are clicking other, please type into the chat um, what some of those other challenges, changes have been that you've had to do. All of the above, absolutely. Organizational structure, all of the above, absolutely. Implementing new tech tools, pricing changes, acquisition of a company. Um, I've had some personal experience with that, which I'll talk about in a moment. M&A activity. New demo, new hires. Yeah, so quite a bit, quite a variety that we're seeing here, Ariel, both in the poll and, and in the chat. Absolutely, and it looks like uh, most of the participants have put in their uh, mm -hmm. responses, give you like five more seconds if you haven't uh, just yet, and then we'll end the poll and show the results. I don't know, Michael, if it's me that should end the poll or, or you would? Yep, nope, those are, we, we ended it now, so uh, we should oh, see that final come awesome. through now. There we go. So what, what's your take, Tara? It looks like new product rollout is the, is the leader. 
Yes, definitely. And I think that that hits across no matter what industry you work in, um, new products are always coming out, whether it's a product or service. So, so not surprising. The sales methodology is pretty high as well. Um, I think that just shows that companies are really trying to find the right fit of sales methodology, as well as how to roll out their products. And just to add, I have one that doesn't actually fit on any of these either. Um, Twilio works in the communications industry, of course. So sometimes our changes that we're trying to manage are completely external factors. For example, there's changes in the regulatory um, in regulations that cover the communications industry, everything from cell phones and, and numbers. And sometimes it changes mobile carriers have new registration, new regulations, and that all impacts us and how we go to market. So it's definitely a challenge to balance not only the internal change management, but then how to address that external force of change management that comes down on all of us as well, which of course is a little less predictable than the internal change, I think at times. Absolutely, and I think that just kind of riffing off of that, what I've seen sales enablement is being this very important middle layer of driving that change because you have say leadership, the CEO or others say, okay, this is what we're doing. This is strategy, this is the direction. It's a new product or it's a new methodology or a new messaging that we're being rolled out. And now changing behaviors in the field, especially for those of us who are kind of sales driven organizations and changing the behaviors of the sales professionals, that's hard. And that's where sales enablement kind of kicks in and takes the, the lead many times in driving those changes. So I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, the audience, maybe you can comment in the chat as well, like how long does it take today to kind of roll out a new product or roll out a new sales methodology? And think about it not only until you have uh, the deck ready and you've sent the deck and maybe you've done a fireside chat, but actually the sales team are speaking it fluently, using it, talking about it as if it was their second nature. So how long does that typically take for you? If you can just comment on the chat on that. And I know Tara, if you wanna share from your experience what you've seen there. Yeah, and it, sometimes you have the luxury of time with other changes you don't. And I think what's really key here is you have to, as much as you want to be proactive, sometimes you also have to be reactive. And it's really those companies that are reactive uh, and are able to adapt and change quickly come out on top. Sometimes, for example, if it's a merger and it's a new product, you may have you know 12 months, you're going to have a longer period of time to start rolling that out. Other times you have less time, um, especially as I mentioned, like some of those regulatory changes, they may be going to effect in two months. And so you have a much more compressed time Companies, when it comes to product, I think companies that have a predictable rollout schedule, if you know that you know new products are rolled out once a quarter or twice a year, it allows you an enablement to, to be able to plan for that. But you always have that rolling cycle and how quickly the AEs can absorb that and start delivering it, as you said, make it you know become their second nature and speak to it. If you have a smaller product set, I think it's a little bit easier for them. But if you work in a company that has a larger product set or a larger set of services, it gets hard for the AEs. I mean, it takes them a little bit longer, especially if you're rolling out multiple changes at the same time. And that's where enablement really needs to come in and, and help share our expertise on, okay, how do we do this in a very programmatic way that makes sense for the AEs as well as you know, upper management. So we're getting that done, but the AEs are, are presented it in a way that they can absorb it, internalize it and start putting it into practice. Yeah, I'm seeing some interesting comments in the chat here as well, uh, Terry and Ariel, just about how people are yeah. seeing a difference between us getting that thing launched and people starting mm -hmm. to demonstrate those behaviors and actually uh, kind of embrace and embody that. And even some folks commenting that they're, uh, the industry is hiring people who are focusing specifically on these things. So interesting and relates yeah. to what you're saying. Absolutely, and Elizabeth and, and Adam about the kind of the initial jump and then until you get like to the 80% mark that everybody's kind of adopting it. I think that's a very smart way of, of describing it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about, let's just stop the sharing of the results if, if they're still shared and 
let's just talk a little bit about why is the uh, driving uh, change so hard, right? So uh, look, this is a, a framework uh, so so nicely and eloquently articulated in this in this nice photo from this beloved movie uh, to think about it because the drivers of change is uh, is enablement, but the recipients of it that have to implement it is sales. So I know Tara, if you want to want to start, then I'll kind of chime along on this on the framework yeah, and, and the thought process. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just reading the note and Jay makes a great point that we're, we're going to talk about where fully enabled is about performance, not knowledge. And you're spot on with that, Jay. But when you go through it to get to move them from just that initial to that performance, that's where this framework comes into play. And it's all about, you know, attention, grabbing the salespeople's attention. And how you do that is by helping them see the value as an AE doesn't matter if you're in a big or a small company, you have a lot of things coming at you. You have all sorts of new initiatives and sales programs. Everyone wants a salesperson's attention. And when you're trying to drive the change, the very first thing is how do you get their attention? How do you get them focused to understand the value to them as well as the value to the customers and then create that interest? Um, again, some people are yeah, I've, I've got enough going on. I'm not going to look at this. So as enablement, we've got to look at that. How do we get their attention? How do we get their interest? And usually that interest is the old acronym of WIFM, what's in it for me, helping them understand the value to them ultimately, as well as the value to their customers. And then, of course, we start moving into the decisioning. You know, How do we get them comfortable and proficient, or as I like to say, confident and competent enough to start selling something new? Because until they get to that point where they are comfortable, they are confident, that's what's going to eventually drive that action and drive that performance. As, as Jay mentioned before, you can share the knowledge, but if you're not driving them to take that action and put it into their, their daily practice and the performance, it's not going to be an effective change management. Absolutely. And Ariel, I know yeah, risk aversion is a, a good point. I know you can talk to as well. Yeah, for sure. So I th I'm thinking about it, especially with the larger sales teams, you're almost like market to the sales team. You're almost like selling to the sales team why they should go for it. And I think that risk aversion, what we've seen working with different organizations is that say we talked about launching a new product, say this is an add-on product. So you have your main product that you've been selling for a while and now you have a new add-on product. And this new product, if you're not 100% confident about it, then uh, you're like you're hesitant to talk about it because if mm -hmm. the the buyer would know more than you and might put you on the spot you might lose your credibility and that credibility loss can go beyond just this add-on it could risk your entire deal because if you don't know exactly what you're talking about if you don't know the industry if you don't know the competitors if you don't know the terms it might put you in a place that you lose this kind of trusted advisor role that it's so important for the, the sales that we've seen people go through. So I think that that's where kind of, yes, you got my attention with this new product launch. It's interesting, but for me to decide that I'm actively going to raise this in each and every conversation, I will have to go over my risk aversion. And I think that's like, you can think about it like a bias for convergence to the status quo, right? Staying in the status quo, not growing beyond that and just staying there. And I think that's a decision point that, uh, that has to be taken. Now, one, uh, one measurement of that, or one way that, uh, that we're seeing organizations handle that is through SPIFs, right? So giving a SPIF and uh, sometimes people think of sales as very simple, coin operated, you give them more money and things would work. And uh, I don't know what the audience uh, think. And then Tara, what do you think? Like are SPIFs yeah. by themselves enough to drive change? Uh, why, why yes and why not? Yeah, and it's interesting. There's some comments I'm looking in the chat right now about in general, salespeople being coin operated. Uh, you know, what is it that, what's going to help them get their target? And as you said, to get them comfortable to shift out of what they, they do. And I think SPIFs can be really good to help spark interest. Um, it's going to get that initial interest, but if you don't 
give them over that risk by making them confident and competent to adopt that change, to start working with whether it's a new, you know, new product, a new message, whatever it is, they're going to make the decision to stay where they are, regardless of the spiff. If you don't give them the tools and the knowledge for them to carry that forward, you know, they're going to stay in that comfort zone where they know, um, where they know they can be successful. So the spiffs I think are good for sparking that interest, but that's just the first step. A spiff alone is not going to drive the adoption of change. And I, it looks like in a lot of the comments, we're hearing the same thing. Uh, yeah, spiffs sometimes seem more like a Band-Aid short-term solution. They can be effective for some, but the other 80%. And I would tend to agree, in my experience, both currently and in the past, the people who are most successful at making money off of spiffs are already the higher performing salespeople. Um, the ones who aren't as higher performing that you're trying to lift up through your enablement, it, it's not always the best incentive for them. Absolutely. And, and also there's like also a limit to how many spiffs you can use. It's like, a, a, there's, there's a limit to how many spiffs you can use, especially in the large organizations, many products, many rollouts, many changes. Eventually it loses its pool because like relatively small uh, amount of, of cash that people would get. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think we have a poll for that as well, just to see what's the kind of what's the consensus in terms of spiffs on their own. Uh, yeah, and there's been some great chat um, chat about it as well, and it seems to be quite a pretty much a consensus that you know the, they spark the interest and they can get it going but it's not going to last that's just the you know the very tip of it and i think that's true even if it's you know a pretty significant spiff it will spark the interest but you still as an enablement professional need to give them that skill and the knowledge to manage that change and understand how to deliver on that in effective performance yeah and it looks like our poll is is agreeing with that as well and I like Tom's comment, yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, spiffs are great, but if the product doesn't really benefit the, the customer, <laughs> then uh, whose agenda is getting pushed? Right. So again, I think that that's absolutely right. The, the underlying assumption is that there are other teams of developing the right products for the right buyers, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the challenge is actually helping the sales team relay that. If you, mm -hmm. if the company is developing products that have no value, then that's a whole different challenge. Yeah, I think we can end and share the poll, but um, Emily just made a, a great comment too, where they found success with SPIFs, getting those top performers bought in and then partnering them as champions to help drive the adoption. So that's another good way to look at it. Whenever you can use you know, high performers to help drive adoption as again, a, a piece of your toolbox that won't completely do, but it is a great Great observation as well. Another way to leverage enablement, but use those champions as well. So you can see in the survey now, uh, overwhelmingly, it works when combined with training and coaching. And I, I'm not surprised by that consensus. Are you, Ariel? No, not at all. I, I really like the comment that it could help kind of, it could help spark the interest and it could also help the try this uh, that, that Tom wrote here that. Uh, I think that making the first sale or making the first pitch or raising a new product for the first time, I think that's like a, a, a mental leap that you have to take as a sales professional. Once you've done it once or twice, then you're already in the zone and then it, uh, it, it just goes, whether it's a new product, a new message, uh, a, a new market, et cetera. I think that eventually people sell what they know, right? They sell what they know, they sell Absolutely. what they're comfortable with. And that's the way that, uh, that they do it. And driving change is about driving them out of their comfort zone and into a, doing something new that they were not comfortable mm -hmm. about before. So I think uh, with that, why don't you tell us a little bit, Tara, about uh, kind of a case study of what you had for driving change specifically in Twilio? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a very recent uh, case study for me. At the end of Q4, Q1, um, we were trying to roll out both uh, an updated corporate messaging as well as get our, our field 
ready to sell some products from a company that we had recently acquired. So as you can imagine, Q4, Q1, there's a lot of distractions going on. They're trying to close out their year. They're trying to get focused on sales kickoff. And we're trying to initiate change on two pretty major um, corporate initiatives, both that corporate messaging and our the new products. So this, this framework really helps guide through that. So with the attention, we did create a spiff. Absolutely, as everybody says, it's a great way to draw that attention. And we combine that though with some awareness campaigns working within our enablement team. We also have a communications group. So we combine that as you know multiple layers of communications as well as that spiff to grab their attention and then to help get them interested, you know, show the value to the salespeople is we tried to show how this is going to impact their ability to hit their, their quota. And there were some quota spiffs in there as well. We also had some cash prizes that we put together as part of our enablement. And I'll tell you what our decision was and how we did that. But we put together through our enablement cash prizes and leaderboards. So we gamified it as well. So our decision was to leverage our sales kickoff event that was about to come up and more importantly, to leverage technology. And what we did is, you know, doing an hour long e-learning or webinar, we knew was not gonna cut it. We needed to have multiple touches and we needed to have a different approach to help get those salespeople, again, comfortable, confident and competent to start delivering these new messaging. So we started with, you know, a micro learning that we actually did as part of our sales kickoff. Um, and we did all the usual completion tracking, but then we impl employed some great technology. And this is actually where Ariel and I um, partnered together using the AI simulation tool from Second Nature, because we wanted to set up, um, train, the, train the field on what these new pitches were, but give them the opportunity to practice in an environment that wasn't in front of the client. So they both, they had two different pitches. We actually set aside time as part of sales kickoff for them to practice it. And the beauty of using the uh, technology like an AI sim is it allowed them to practice multiple times. It also gave them, we set up the criteria of scoring. And so it became a very objective scoring criteria. Did you hit each of these key talking points? And it also was able to give them feedback on their delivery. So it wasn't just, did you hit the right words, but you know, what was your pace like? What was your energy level? Were you making eye contact, et cetera? So it gave them immediate feedback. Now, the really nice part about this is in the past, um, you would have had to do this in front of your manager. And that takes a lot of time from a sales manager to listen to a pitch from all of their reps and to listen to it by more than once. Um, somebody asked, how many reps did we train? We rolled this out to almost 2,000 people. It was a global rollout. So we needed to be able to scale. Great question. We needed to scale. We wanted to get this done fast. So we used the, the micro learning, which was e-learning. And then we let them practice as many times as they wanted with the AI simulation before they submitted it. They got their immediate score. They got their immediate feedback. And then when they were comfortable enough and they thought they did, wow, this I, I, I nailed this pitch, I did well, then they submitted it to their manager. We had leaderboards. And like I said, we actually, our uh, chief revenue officer put a pretty significant cash prize for the top pitches. So they were earning cash for delivering their top pitch all before they ever went and talked in front of a customer. And I think that was key. It gave them the time and the environment to hone their pitch and get comfortable and competent with it before they started going out. Awesome, that's great. And it, just just for the audience who's maybe not familiar with this uh, software mm -hmm. of AI simulated pitches, could you explain like, I'm sure that you've had before more of the standard practices like a standard deliver, where you could record yourself and send it and the manager would give you feedback. What would you say is the difference between like a standard deliver and an AI simulation? Yeah, absolutely. And I've used the stand and deliver either in person or just recorded uh, many times in the past. Two huge differences. First of all, is it becomes the AI simulation allows to be a two-way conversation. That's the power of having an AI simulation. This, uh, the simulation tool will ask you. And for those of you asking, yes, we use second nature as our tool um, because it allows it to be a, a dialogue back and forth, the AI is simulating the customer, they can ask questions. And even if it was smart enough to know that if the salesperson really missed a key point, 
they could be prompted by the customer by the customer question. So when you're doing the traditional, it was always just a monologue. It was me sitting down, you know, as a salesperson with my deck and just recording myself delivering. It wasn't really a, a good s- simulation of what it's like talking to a customer. So having that two way, and then that automatic feedback is huge. As soon as you're done, being able to see your objective scorecard, um, because let's face it, sometimes when you're pitching and you're giving it to a manager and a manager has 20 different pitches to review and score, sometimes it, it just, it's not as consistent. There's some fatigue. So it's easier for the manager, but more importantly, the salesperson got that immediate feedback. And if they didn't like it, they could erase it or they could keep it. They could re-record it multiple times, immediately putting into practice that feedback that they received from the simulation tool. So that's the biggest advantage of using an interactive simulation tool versus a traditional record yourself and submit it. Now, Tara, I do see some questions coming in as well, just about what the yeah. impact was and how you kind of, uh, well, I guess the, the original question was how, how you measured impact of sales when you go through some of these changes. And I don't know if mm-hmm. that's something you lay out uh, very clearly before, so it's easy to measure back to, or what was your process with that? Yeah. So, and I also saw what was the objective scoring based on, we, we worked with, um, with our product marketing team very closely, of course, to identify, okay, what are the key talking points that should be should be addressed in it. And again, what's nice is the SIM, because you go to learning mode, it doesn't have to be a verbatim word. The SIM is smart enough to know, did you hit it, but in your own words. So it wasn't just someone reading their script and it could give them the feedback of, we defined um, as the enablement team, we defined what the four or five key objectives were of what needs to be delivered during this this pitch, this customer conversation. So we defined it and the AI would would listen to it. Now what's really cool is if they totally missed an area, the tool would allow you as as the learner to click on and say, here, watch a video clip of a best practice of someone delivering what great sounds like on this key point. They can listen to the whole or just that one key point. So that's how we looked at the objectives of the, the pitch. Now, as far as how effective this was overall, you know, this was actually just a few months ago, but we are, you know, we're tracking it. How is it impacting our pipe gen? How is it impacting deals closed? You know, how is it impacting? We use other tools such as Gong. So when we're doing analysis out of a tool like Gong, how many times are we hearing, you know, the key phrases and, and pitches being discussed? with the customer as well, you know, either the product or if it's a corporate messaging. So we can look at how it's disseminating out beyond that training, how it's being used with the customer and ultimately how it's impacting our sales. This is great. Mm-hmm. And, and just, just to pick Go up ahead, on Tara, that, yeah. Go ahead. Tara, like I think that measuring the impact is critical and I think it's different from one organization to another and it's different Absolutely. also in type of, of role to another. So if you're just say an SDR or BDR, or if you're selling a very transactional product, then you can see those cycles kind of end really quickly and you can see the actual lagging indicators really fast. If you're an SDR that you're booking more meetings with this. If you're kind of a one call close or three call close kind of organization, then you're seeing those really fast. If your sales cycle is a little bit longer, which I think Twilio is predominantly on that side, uh, then you could start seeing the, and I, I won't share obviously anything from, from Twilio's data, mm-hmm. nor that I have the access to it, but uh, what we've seen from, from other customers is that they, they start seeing the leading indicators pretty fast, and a leading indicator would be amount of times that uh, this new product is being mentioned on the calls with the call recording like Gong the number of open opportunities that are being opened, the size of the pipeline that is being built, and then kind of building up to uh, how many deals are being closed, et cetera. I think that's a very important metric. Another metric that we found people measure is the percentage of the sales team who's actually engaged with this product. And by engaged, I mean either talk about it, open opportunities or whatnot. So going back to the point that we've made before, that people sell what they know. If you were able with this kind of attention, interest, decision, action, if you were able to win another 10%, 20%, 30% of your sales force to start working this product, then you've made a, a big impact. 
on their overall, and you can identify that rather quickly. I absolutely agree. And Michael, you and have you a know, question. I, I interrupted you, so sorry. It was exactly that. You read my mind. I was going to ask about what some of those leading indicators were that, that you'd be looking for as you started to go through a change rollout uh, to let you know that you have generated that attention, that interest, that decision, and that action. So very well stated. Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. So I think this was is something that uh, that the Tara kind of shared shared with me in other conversations. I just wanted to, uh, yeah, kind of share that with the audience and kind of get your take on this. Absolutely, and I have to give credit to this quote to Paul Smith, um, author of several great books. But this just resonated so much with me, and it's what you were just saying as well. People really aren't afraid of change. They're afraid of not being prepared for the change. And that's where we as enablement professionals need to help them feel prepared, feel confident, feel that, feel ready to, to go forward with that change instead of just putting them on it. So this is the one thing that resonates most with me. And I think if you take nothing else away, just remember that it's our jobs as, as enablement professionals to have them feel confident that they are prepared for that change. Absolutely. And just to kind of pick up on that and uh, and give some more perspective. So I'll use the stage and share some other stories from other customers of ours. So we work with a company called Checkpoint, their cybersecurity company, one of the leading ones or, or the leader in the space and been around for a while. And the change that one of the changes they've been through is kind of the move to the cloud, right? So selling, uh, you sell more traditional security products and in transition to the cloud. And we've seen many companies been through this cycle, kind of more mature companies who've kind of moving to this uh, cloud era. They have many cloud products and now a leader in that space, but how do you take an existing sales team and help them transition into selling a whole new different mindset? So it's a new narrative, it's a new mindset. There's a new terminology, there's a, there's a, a, a new talk track and new pricing. It's very new. And I think that driving that, that change for them was not easy. And I think that what worked for them is understanding the change is a process. It doesn't happen overnight and building a program that would match that. So yes, you can do the initial kind of elevator pitch, throwing people into the water and helping them kind of live the moment and just do it like Tara did at, uh, at Twilio's that within the SKO, everybody kind of went in and did it within like a couple of days. You had so many people who've completed that and already felt a lot more comfortable, confident and proficient delivering that. And then doing a reinforcement on a cadence. So with them, for example, we've been doing like every month, something, a new aspect of it, a new type of buyer, a new type of product, a new type of challenge to go through to really make sure that this change uh, sinks in. So it's not a one and done, but more of a process. Completely agree there, absolutely. And that's what's key is that follow-up process. Absolutely. So just to kind of uh, maybe start summarizing the, the way that we've been thinking about it and that we've been talking about it, uh, is starting off from the top, which is strategy. It's coming from the top, coming from leadership, goes through enablement, who's the critical part of tr translating the strategy into action in the field and into the tactics and into the deliverables. And in order to do that, we have to get the participation, the attention, the interest, the decision and the action of the sales team themselves. Uh, and getting attention is great with incentives, is great with success stories because we're all fed by success. So highlighting one of the sales professionals and giving him his moment of, of uh, to shine and help people, other people replicate him, right? So you can do, we had uh, partners with people that did that and say, hey, you know, Joe closed this amazing deal for this product X. So you do a reinforcement activity, 
and you show a short video of Joe and he tells how he sold Rock X to this new uh, uh, company. And then everybody gets to walk a mile in Joe's shoes and actually do the role play of <laughs> what, what was Joe facing when he sold Rock X to UBC. What was their objections? What were their concerns? How did they overcome them? So you get to feel what the, the feel of success uh, there. So I think that's like a, an attention with success stories. I think the interest uh, is really get everybody excited about it and, and creating a buzz, especially in a large organization. And we've done with, uh, like with Zoom, we've done a real competition as well, we have a case study about this, like of getting people excited and doing building like a group dynamic around it. So what we did there is more of a team competition. So it, it's not a competition of who does the best pitch like personally, but how can you take a whole team and score the mm -hmm. team? So if some person doesn't do it, he hurts the entire team. And then there becomes like this group dynamic of which team is it Jen's team or is it Joe, Steve, and who's winning and who gets more uh, credit for it. And yes, there was some kind of prize for that, but also a lot of recognition. And people love that, uh, that recognition. So that's like on the attention and the interest side. I think on the decision, and the, by decision, I mean like getting into a point where a rep feels comfortable and confident enough to make a decision that he's going to talk about this in the next sales call or during the call and raise it up and handle the objections there. And I think this is really about how confident they are. And what we found is that sending decks or doing a fireside chat where you do a, just a Zoom webinar to everyone really doesn't do the trick. You have to have an ongoing program that does that and that gets people confident enough in doing so. And yet you can do it through stand and delivers if you have the resource to scale that. You can do it through recording with a gong or a course or any other tool. And then you need the resources to uh, do that and, uh, and review it. But eventually, if you want to do something at the scale without kind of risking your customers and your prospects and the existing deals, then uh, having a conversational AI simulation is, is a option that it should be considered. And then eventually and, is the, the rollout. Yeah, go ahead, Tara. I just wanted to jump in on that point um, where the AI sim really helped us scale. As I said, we were rolling this out to almost 2,000 people. And one of the really cool stats that we got out of this is we looked at from the first time they practiced the pitch to the time that they had their best score. And for one of ours, it was almost, a, it was like a 48% improvement. So that talk about helping instill, instill that confidence on average, their delivery, just practicing on their own, getting that immediate feedback and resubmitting it improved 48% between their first practice and their best practice just within sometimes a matter of days. So I think that just reinforces that you've got to let them do it multiple times. And that shows the power of using something that can scale where they got that much better before they ever talk to a client. There's a couple Absolutely. of questions that have come through chat that I think are interesting around this kind of model, the attention, interest, decision, and action. And, and uh, one was just around, um, have you seen any impact uh, before, during, after the pandemic when there's a lot of people working virtually? I don't think you've mentioned it yet. So I thought that was just kind of interesting. Has that affected that change rollout at all, that gamification, that, that team spirit? And then we've got one more that I'll come back to, but I'll start with that one. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Tara, do you want to go you. first? Yeah. yeah. So, gosh, was there a time before the pandemic? I, I know, It's hard right? to remember I that guess. world. Uh, you know, in, in obviously not having face-to-face -face changes it. Um, trying to keep people's attention when you're doing, you know, virtual training is, is a little bit more difficult. But on the other hand, leveraging technology like an AI sim or even the, the, the you know, recording like Gong or Chorus or something, um, gives you that advantage. It, it actually helps you focus in and, and get some of those analytics out of it. So yeah, of course, not having people in one room, but on the other hand, sometimes if you have everybody together in a room, you're not going to be able to do role plays as easily. And if you do, some people just aren't as comfortable, <clears throat> excuse me, delivering live right away. Using something offline um, allows them to practice 
lets them feel a bit more comfortable, maybe take a little bit of a risk. So they won't be as, as shy about sharing, or they don't want to be embarrassed in front of their peers. So that's been one of the advantages of going virtual and being able to reach a broader audience. And, you know, I was mm -hmm. working across the globe and we were able to even do our Sims in local language in some countries like Japan and in Latin America. So, um, that's what we got in Ariel, I'll let you address the question with, with multiple languages in the second with the sim, but we were able to leverage that. So the impact, yes, you, you lost um, that face-to-face -face interaction, having to all be virtual, but then being virtual, first of all, you had somewhat of a captive audience and that nobody was traveling as much. So you could schedule times and, and have them and leverage these great tech tools to roll out that we'll continue to use even you know in the post-pandemic world because they're so great. Yeah, for sure. And I hear that as well. We certainly saw less people a uh, half day and full day uh, trips in their calendars yes. that made it a little bit easier with scheduling and still just being creative to get that attention and still keep people motivated yes. to make some of those changes. Thank you. Yeah. Ariel, I don't know if you had anything to add. Yeah, I, I have a little bit to add maybe. So we're working with, with SAP as an example and uh, they're like early onboarding uh, academy or the SAP academies and th they used to kind of fly people over and have them stay for a few weeks and do the entire kind of onboarding, et cetera. And then with the, with, with the pandemic, they had to go remote. So then they had to take the entire curricula from in-person to remote. And there's just a limit to how many hours you can sit in front of a Zoom uh, and, and get kind of just absorb, absorb, absorb. So they had to break it down with some interactive simulations within it. So. I would say if you're going remote, then you'd better make it as interactive as possible to keep it interesting. I'd say that's point number one. Point number two is there's nothing like meeting face-to-face -face and, and kind of feeding a person and having a conversation hands down, like no interactive AI would match that. Having said that, there are a disadvantage to it as well. And, and someone wrote in the chat like, a, Oh yeah, I'd love to do a role play. Said no sales rep ever, right? So and and why is that, right? And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Like nobody likes that because what happens is the experience that we have as sales professionals for role play is that you have a room full of people, like those round tables, everybody sitting together. You have a small stage. You have 50 people on the audience, and then someone calls you up to the stage and say, "Okay, now let's role play," and that's so stressful and so embarrassing, right? Even if you do it in the smaller groups and you have someone who's walking around and it, it feels very awkward and you don't want to really expose yourself to someone who doesn't know. So I think that the ability when you're doing it remote to do it within your own safe, uh, thank you, Tom, doing it within your own safe environment, I think that's, uh, that's critical. So I would say, yes, there's, there's pluses and minuses. There's a balance between the two and there's a, benefits for both but if you're doing remote make it interactive and allow people to just get the practice in yeah and i also saw a question here thank you for that that insight because i think you're right it's about how we we take advantage of uh that that situation as well as uh, kind of uh look for opportunities that, that we don't necessarily replace face to face 100 percent, but we can take advantage of some of those situations where people are remote and working that way um and i also saw a couple of questions in here that said you know you looked at when you talked about measuring that change you started to think about the language that people were using the words they were using and those sorts of things um, with a variety of tools that were, you, you were using. And the question is really around where does the, I'll summarize a little, where does uh, that sentiment understanding and that intent in the voice of, of a sales rep still come in? So um, how have you addressed that? And then how do we start to measure that change, not just on the keywords, but also around the intent and sentiment? Absolutely. I, I can try and take the first stab at it. So I think that what we do is we, we try and measure everything as much as we can. So for example, how fast are you speaking? How long are your sentences? How confident are you? Are you using a lot of filler words? And the way that the interaction works is what we found is when sales reps are pressed with hard questions, A, they change their pace. Some of them go faster, some of them go slower. B, they tend, that tends to be the area where they start adding more filler words. So saying, oh, how are we different than uh, Gong? Well, um, you know, that's a great question, you know? 
and uh, they start adding those filler words so you can feel that that's the area that's the question that they're less confident about so i would say those kind of intonations pace a level of confidence and engagement that they have really uh, kind of help build up the the scoring as well as the identification of areas that needs more practice and focus so even if we were listening to those reps and just kind of overhearing some of those calls we might start to our ears might start to perk up and say aha there's still this area where you know maybe i've gotten their attention and their interest but they're not quite to that confidence stage yet and that might be a something that tells us that we yes absolutely you would and but i think that some of the things people can identify much better than ai like the look like some of the nuances that are more soft some of them are harder for people Mm -hmm. Just like measuring the number of filler words per minute sure. is very hard for a person. It's much easier for a, a computer. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, and, and I think that goes back to what we're talking about. There's not just one perfect solution for it all. It's looking at what's the right combination of technology and enablement approaches. What's the right combination and spreading that out over time to help drive that change and help affect that ultimate performance as well and adapting it of course you're gonna to have to do some adaptation for the level of rep um, you know looking at their tenure and their role as well as individual characteristics but it's finding that great combination that does the reinforcement and gives people different modalities to work with as well that's going to help them build up that confidence absolutely yeah. i just want to respond to one other question i've saw i've seen from sean in the in the chat it takes it a little bit sideways, but I think it's an important one. Like he says, he's a sales leader, is, doesn't have a lot of time, and he wants to review recorded calls and give feedback on them, but it's hard to make the time for that, if I understand the question correctly. And is there something that solves for it? So I would say there's nothing like having a conversation with your rep. What we help do with Second Nature, with other customers, and Twilio included, is say, let's take the basics, okay? There's a new product. What are the basics? Can an, a, a newly hire or a rep give an elevator pitch? Can they run the discovery call and identify the right material, ask the right questions, get the right answers? Can it do qualification? Can it do the basic objection handling? Can it do the ROI calculation? Can it deliver the deck? Let's just say just these six, seven basic things, basic conversations or elements within the conversation and have that practiced with the AI and get the feedback on it. And then when the manager comes, he doesn't have to go through everything. He could identify, say, okay, it looks like elevator pitch is good, going through the deck is good, but asking the right questions in the methodology that we've chosen, whether it's challenger, whether it's uh, corporate visions, whether it's something else, you're missing there because you're not asking all the right questions. You don't go into implication questions. You're just going on to situation and problem. Here's something to work on. Let's work on implication questions right now. So what we do is we take the load of the baseline, just the elevator pitch, discovery, the presentation, objection handling, demo, et cetera, and then give the manager really to focus on where the gaps are. Uh, and I think that kind of, uh, just in the essence of time, kind of uh, dovetails into how can sales enablement evolve, right? Which is uh, where can we take it from here? I don't know, Tara, if you want to take like the lead on that. Sure. Yeah, and, and as it said, really our, our number one job is to be that business partner to our stakeholders, which is, you know, whether it's the sales or corporate, but we need to partner with them on it. Um, and, and make sure that it's a two-way conversation. It's not just the CEO coming and saying, I need this and go do it. Make sure you're understanding that because you need to have that partnership to really help drive that, that confidence building in your sellers. Um, you want to look at reaching your sellers in a variety of different modalities like we were talking about. You know, there's not one magic answer. There's some it's a combination of tools. It's also some of that personal one-to-one -one coaching and, and mentoring. It's, uh, you know, webinars and it's e-learning, some of our traditional tools as well. But what's really important is meeting the learners and your users where they're at. 
you know, one size fits all just doesn't apply anymore. You're going to have to look at how am I going to address this for more tenured people versus less tenured people. Maybe you have different types of um, go to market sales reps. So an enterprise sales play is going to be different from a growth sales play. So looking at who they are and having that variety to meet them where they're at and even their knowledge level. Some people are already going to be very well versed in some products, but not in others. So building that flexibility in there. And, you know, for me, a big one is obviously leveraging technology to scale. Twilio is a very fast growing company. I've worked at other companies that are fast growing and neither ones that aren't. But with companies, you know, when I was at HP, we had 300 or some thousand people. It doesn't matter the size you're never going to have enough enablement people. I've never heard anybody say, you know what? My enablement department is so big. I have people I don't know what we're doing with. It just doesn't happen. So that's where we've got to be smart as enablement professionals and leverage the technology. That's what's going to help us scale and make sure that we have consistency of message. We're providing that objective, consistent feedback as well. You know, our traditional hour-long e-learning courses, they have a time and a place, but it's not going to fly for every situation. Um, you have to use those very strategically. So as a profession, we have to get more creative looking at all these different tools, looking at different processes that drive the awareness and the adoption of change. And ultimately, you know, just help make sure that we are giving sales the comfort to practice and perfect the message that they need to deliver before they ever have to face the customer. Absolutely. That, that's so well said. I don't know if I can top that. I think that the one thing that I might add is just thinking about different generations and how they would like to learn because it's about learning and, and embedding the learning and then being able to articulate it on your own. And I think that many times what worked for some generations, which is you kind of watch, watch, watch a video or read, 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 and then do a quiz, like it's like learning, 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 learning assessment works less for how we, we work today. So think about how we're learning today. You're going in, you're just trying to do your job, you're missing some piece of information, you're going online, you're going on Google, you're going on YouTube, you're finding that exact piece that you're looking for and you're going back to work, right? So this kind of just-in-time learning and modular learning, et cetera. And what we found is sometimes people just skip the entire learning and say, okay, let's just go right to the sim. Let's just go right at it. Let's try and do the pitch. And then they get like a reader and they say, okay, you're doing part one, two, and three good, but four, five, and six, you're missing. And then they focus on learning that, whether in external content or within the sim itself or watching a video. And then the learning is not like linear. It's more of a cyclical. You're trying something, you're practicing it, you're getting more insights, you're trying it again, you're getting more insights. Like you would learn to play a musical instrument or like you would mm -hmm. learn to play you know, sports. It's just about getting it into the uh, zone of practice. We have two more minutes. I don't know, Michael, if there's any other questions. There's one more the question. It, it kind of relates to that as well. And it was a question about a high growth organization and where they, they have different demographics and age and region and those types of things across the globe. And they've noticed different adoption of the things they're rolling out, like their CRMs and training, that sort of thing. It's kind of capturing everybody. How do we pull everybody forward? And it kind of goes to what you were saying, Ariel, that different people are looking at things differently. I don't know if you have any final parting words of advice for that question. No, I, I think it's about uh, evaluating different tools, looking at the needs for scaling and, and adapting to what the younger audience or to other audiences need in order to make them more effective. And I think that what we've seen everywhere is just everything is accelerating. Mm -hmm. Everything is accelerating. There's no time. No, the, zoo, the time span is, is, is compressing. There's no time. People just want to go in and do it and then just go in and, and do it on the calls and on the work, et cetera. So I think that anything that can help compress that learning time and get you into productivity faster is a good thing to consider. Yeah. Well, I know we are at about time. So I want to uh, say it's been a pleasure hearing from all of you on the call with all the insights, questions, and great takeaways. So a thank you uh, to our guest presenters as well for sharing that industry insight. Um, and I know, uh, I think we've got your, your emails here on the final slide as well, if people do have follow-up questions 
uh, as well, but I'm just uh, conscious of the time. Um, but if you do have any final parting thoughts, Tara and Ariel, we just want to say thank you for, for walking us through that. If you have any final thoughts, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go now. And, and, and if not, we'll, we'll probably wrap it up here. Yeah. And just thank you all for the opportunity. Um, thanks for sharing all of the wonderful insights and continue to share. Absolutely. It's a great community. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for sharing the, your time with us. Great. And I see some requests for recording, so that will be uh, out there eventually as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and looking forward to our next session in a few weeks.